to the Laguna Woods Democratic Club's meeting. LWDC is doing its best to bring all the Democratic candidates in the local races to speak so that you can make up your own minds about who is the best candidate. Today we have with us one candidate for California Senate District 37, Senator Josh Newman. Now let's review the process for this interview, which is the same as it was for our July meeting when we had another District 37 Senate candidate with us, Alex Mahajer. Senator Newman will have three minutes to introduce himself. Then he will be asked six questions submitted by members of the club and have two minutes to answer each question. Senator Newman has not seen these questions ahead of time. After the six questions, Senator Newman will have two minutes to um, give his closing remarks. Alan Feldman will be the timer, Jonathan Adler, will be the moderator and will ask the questions. Josh Newman grew up in New York, graduated from Yale and served in the army as an artillery officer. After relocating to California, he founded a project for veterans to aid them in their civilian careers. He has been a member of the California Senate since 2016. There he led reforms um, reform efforts to end the abuses of the recall system, and he helped pass bills for veterans and mental health care, better schools, job creation, and open space protection. Welcome, Senator Josh Newman. Thank you, Sue, and thank you to the Laguna Woods Democratic Club for giving me this opportunity. And I do want to apologize, I couldn't make the last meeting uh, as a result of my schedule, uh, but I'm glad to be part of this meeting this evening, and, and I'm grateful again uh, to have a chance to speak to your members. Um, I, as you mentioned, I've had the privilege since 2016 with a brief uh, interruption, uh, which I will get to in a moment, uh, to represent uh, Northern Orange County and, and, and a slice of uh, LA County uh, in the, as uh, the representative of the 29th Senate District of the California State Senate. Uh, I ran in 2016 as a bit of an outsider. Uh, I was new to politics, uh, but not new to public service. I previously, as you mentioned, uh, served in the Army, uh, also worked early in my career uh, in local politics in San Francisco, uh, and then from there worked in uh, the entertainment business for a little while, uh, in technology for about 15 years. And as you mentioned, uh, I, in, in 2012, I started a uh, an initiative to try and better match talented veterans to employers when they came home uh, from their service. Uh, this again was during the Iraq and the Afghanistan wars. Uh, it, in, and we were not doing a good job, I would argue we're still not doing a job uh, in helping uh, veterans with that transition despite our obvious gratitude for their service. Uh, and that experience led me directly into uh, kind of the public sphere and, and exposed me to uh, a great number of elected officials uh, particularly at the state level, where I, I always believe the state had an important role to play in that work. Uh, and I got, frankly, very frustrated at the gap between the rhetoric uh, around veterans, thank you for your service, and the actual programs. Uh, and when the 2016 election was shaping up, uh, I, I, I thought, why not? You know, the politics is, uh, or, you know, elections are really about uh, asking for a job. And, and so I, I, I ran on a, a fairly straightforward, pragmatic program, uh, asking the voters of the 29th Senate District, uh, to select me as the replacement for uh, Bob Huff, who was then turned out. Uh, I wound up winning what turned out to be the closest election at that time in the entire state uh, and had the great you know, fortune of entering uh, the state Senate. Uh, I had then had the misfortune or mixed blessing, I should say, in 2017 of, of being one of the senators who cast a vote for the first bill of the year, SB1, uh, which you may know as the road, the gas tax, also known as the Road Repair and Accountability Act. Uh, I was then targeted uh, for kind of obvious partisan reasons for recall uh, in a, what turned out to be a hyper-partisan but very effective recall effort. Uh, and I was eventually recalled on the ballot uh, in 2018. Uh, and then in 2020, I proceeded to put my name back in the hat uh, and run once again and won by a fairly convincing margin. Uh, and, and I am now running to represent the newly redrawn SD37, which includes my house in the city of Fullerton. Uh, very much looking forward uh, to meeting all the members of the club, very much looking forward to working with the delegates 
uh, and again, grateful for the time today. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Senator Newman. And here's the first question. What is your strategy for winning this election? And what have you already started doing? So my strategy is to run uh, on my record, which I think is uh, fairly persuasive uh, as a testament to my public service and my service to the district. Um, proud of that record, uh, proud of all the votes, no regrets again for any of the votes I've cast, even the one that wound up casting me into uh, temporarily into the, the electoral wasteland. Um, I have been uh, not only successful, but fairly well received. I'm well regarded in the Senate. I am uh, the endorsed candidate by the California State Senate Democratic Caucus and a whole host of other organizations, including labor organizations, which uh, means a lot to me. Um, in terms of fundraising, which is uh, necessary, uh, if not necessarily uh, the most attractive thing, I've, I'm, I'm good at that. So I, I now have well over $700,000 raised uh, in the bank with, with a fairly good assurance uh, to, did I say seven, 700,000? I hope I didn't say 700, 700,000. Uh, and I've, I've raised, you know, over a million dollars thus far. Uh, and it's on the way to having uh, sufficient funds to go out and make my case, not only to Democrats. Uh, I, I, I'd like to think I have fairly high name recognition given my service uh, and my, my past, uh, but also to independents in the district. This is a D plus four district. It's, it's about 37% Democrats by registration, 33% Republicans, 30% independents. It's sort of a classic purple orange County district. Uh, my record and my approach to public service and to politics, I think will serve me well. Uh, I've been pragmatic, I've been effective, uh, and I have been uh, you know, accountable and accessible to the voters uh, in our district. I, I intend to continue doing that. Uh, and so I will be taking the better Senator ice cream truck uh, the, the, out into the district. Some of you may have seen it, some of you may have already enjoyed an ice cream sandwich from it. Uh, as, a, as a tool, uh, if you will, to go out and talk to voters of all stripes, uh, and learn what affects them, what they need, uh, how I can better serve them. So I'm pretty confident in my prospects. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for that. And the next question happens to tie in very closely to something that you spoke about for a few minutes, a few seconds earlier. It is this. Election to the legislature now takes huge sums of money. A lot of it is raised from big special interests and spent not directly by candidates, but by so-called independent, uncoordinated PACs. It seems that such vast sums adversely impact legislators voting far too much. How can legislators fix that? So that is a legitimately good question, uh, and I agree fully with its premise, and, and so, uh, I, I take no great pride in um, having to raise large sums. I, I'm not actually all that proud of being able to do it uh, because to the questioner's point, um, it, it's not really necessarily conducive uh, to the kind of public service and kind of a fair and uh, sort of like open debate that, that we should expect uh, by way of candidates. So long-term, I think one of the most important things we need to lower the barriers uh, to, for all candidates uh, and and money is clearly a barrier. I fully support, you know, various different models. I'm happy to experiment with them for public funding of elections at every level. Um, and, uh, you know, in the era of term limits uh, and sort of hyper-partisan politics, uh, money matters. Uh, it's also important to point out that for a jurisdiction uh, as large as a state Senate district, you know, that's roughly a million people uh, in this district, SD 37, that's 11 medium-sized cities. Uh, so money is, is, you know, unavoidable. You know, it takes a certain amount uh, of, of cold, hard cash to go do anything, including just print flyers to go talk to people. Um, but it should not be the, you know, sort of the defining factor, the limiting factor uh, or a barrier uh, to anybody who aspires to public service. And so we as a legislature, we as a you know, community and a democracy should should fully explore other approaches uh, to anything that makes the playing field more equal. Um, and so, I, you know, this is how I ran in 2016. I was, in fact, uh, a massive underdog. I was outraised by a substantial amount of money. I think I was both creative and effective in getting, you know, out to voters and kind of spreading my message. In fact, my Hello Newman signs uh, were not only effective, they won best yard sign in the country. Uh, it cost me a lot less than I think my opponent spent. 
Um, but you know, we should we we should, as I said, uh, figure out an honest way uh, so that it's it's so that it's ideas and service and not money uh, that determines who represents us at every level. Thank you. Next question is: What do you see as the three most important issues facing our district? 37. So I'm not sure I'll need the whole two minutes. Uh, I, I think the three most important issues facing us are uh, homelessness, right? And homelessness is, is you know, kind of a catch-all for a, a bunch of sort of, uh, sort of uh, coalescing issues, mental health, substance abuse, uh, the cost of housing, economic displacement, uh, other issues. But, you know, collectively, they, they, they make people homeless, and we need to figure out better ways uh, to solve all of the issues that that contribute to people finding themselves without a roof over their heads. I'm actually very proud of a program that for which I have secured funding over six years, uh, over close to $40 million, a, an 11 city collaborative effort called the North Orange County Public Safety Collaborative uh, that is, is, is aligned cities and law enforcement uh, with, with local organizations that are working on the different aspects uh, of not only homelessness, but, but youth violence prevention and post-incarceration reentry challenges to try and find better solutions and by way of that, you know, a better replicatable model for the state as a whole. Uh, the second big problem is the cost of housing uh, that obviously contributes to homelessness. Uh, and we need to find better ways to uh, motivate uh, uh, people, developers, cities, uh, to find every basis to create housing so that our children can afford uh, to live here as homeowners uh, in a very high cost of living state where the cost of real estate and housing continues to go up. The third issue is education. Uh, I'm very proud to be the current chair of the state Senate Committee on Education. Uh, and we need to make sure that all, you know, K through 16, every level of California education, properly funded, uh, properly equipped, uh, properly staffed, uh, and that we make the decisions necessary to make sure that every student in California, irrespective of their zip code uh, or their background, gets the best possible ed education. Within that, I think it's really important deliberately to try, try and figure out how to better align the work day with the school day. Uh, so that working parents uh, can have the resources to put their kids in safe places for learning while going out and finding the jobs that they need to survive in California. Thank you for that. And we'd now like to ask you this. What do you think will be the most important issues facing California in the next few years? One of the biggest issues facing California has manifested itself now. We have a structural revenue problem in California uh, that has produced this year, uh, after massive budget surpluses over the last two years, uh, a very meaningful budget uh, uh, budget deficit. Uh, we went from a historic ninety-seven billion dollar uh, deficit uh, surplus, I'm sorry, last year to a thirty billion dollar deficit this year. California's revenue system is 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 inordinately dependent upon uh, high net worth individuals for our revenues, uh, and as a result. We're extremely dependent on on the market, on the stock market, on big companies doing IPOs and kind of windfalls that that deliver big big tax receipts, uh, and that can give you a boom or bust situation. So, you know, over time, we need to figure out a better, more equitable way to fund our government that doesn't leave us uh, so vulnerable to kind of those those vicissitudes. Uh, the second issue within the California is, is climate. Right, climate will be perhaps the biggest issue we face for the next year, ten years, if not my lifetime and our lifetimes. Uh, and so climate change is obviously real, uh, but we have to look at it across two, two sort of vectors. One is what do we do moving forward? How do we decarbonize California's economy uh, to make sure that we are not contributing, in fact, that we are part of the solution? And the second piece is, is connected. It's how do we prepare for uh, and take the necessary measures in, in response to climate change? We have seen in the most recent storms uh, evidence of just the power of mother nature in the face of climate change. But we're going to have to make really big investments and smart decisions to make sure that our infrastructure is solid uh, and that all of our plans uh, and programs take into account the reality of climate change. Well, thank you. And you actually anticipated the very next question. So feel free to go into a little bit uh, more depth on that. The question is, what priorities do you see for our lar large economy to pivot towards saving the planet before it's too late. Before it's too late, it's, it's a good way of phrasing it. Uh, so, you know, we as legislators, you know, make policies, we also allocate monies. 
Uh, and it's not unlimited this year. Of course, we have a deficit. So really important for us as a state, for the legislature, as a partner to the governor, uh, to, to invest in and make policies that take into account the reality of climate change, but that invest in innovation uh, so that California simultaneously addresses the needs of climate change, but also leads in innovation in the way that we have in environmental issues you know, for the last hundred years. Uh, we can be very proud of some of California's leadership around fuel economy, around a whole host of other uh, environmental standards. We need to do the same thing, but we need to do that in such a way that it actually generates economic growth and good jobs. Uh, and so there are opportunities, one of which I, I'm very involved in right now, uh, which is the, the state has now submitted a really big package, uh, an application to the Biden administration, to the Department of Energy, uh, for something uh, called a hydrogen hub. Uh, and that's that's to get a big grant of approximately $2 billion uh, so that we and other recipients can explore ways to develop green energy uh, that will support industry, heavy industry, uh, you know, transportation, uh, and, and, and build jobs uh, and the economy in the place of high carbon uh, you know, jobs and the high carbon economy that has traditionally characterized California. Uh, it's not a simple thing at all, uh, but it's really important that we make smart decisions now by way of those investments, mass transit, uh, zero emissions vehicles. If we do that wisely now, we should be in good shape in 20, 30 years. Uh, if we don't, we will suffer the consequences. Thank you. And here's the last question. After, after this, you'll have a chance to close. California has a growing divide between the haves and the have-nots. Housing is just one example. How would you specifically help the millions who are falling further into poverty every year? So this is also, and I think one of the perennial questions of our day, income inequality in California uh, is not only stunning, it's growing. Uh, this is a state where if you're very wealthy, this is a wonderful place to live. Uh, this is also a state where if you are poor, uh, it is massively challenging, and and the uh, you know the the extent to which working families uh, have to labor simply to keep a roof over their heads and and food on the table is is really stunning. Uh, and so we need to do a number of things. I, I mentioned education. Uh, education still remains the best best path uh, toward you know economic improvement. Um, you know, especially you know generation to generation. Uh, we need to fix that. Uh, housing. Uh, we need to make sure that we, we don't become a nation of renters. Rents have skyrocketed uh, in the last three, four years. Um, the, the best way to create and pass on gener generational wealth uh, is through housing. So we need to solve California's housing crisis. Uh, and then, you know, the diversification of our economy and, and the insistence uh, as we move into new, new industries uh, and new technologies on, on what they call high road uh, jobs, uh, really important. Uh, California can be very proud that we we are still the leader in unionized work uh, across the country, uh, and we need to reinvest uh, in jobs that not only give uh, people a chance uh, to be part of the evolution of this economy, uh, but that they give families a chance uh, to move up uh, and to afford everything that we take for granted as part of you know the so-called California dream. So, and I think that's a fundamental obligation uh, of the legislature. We are, after all, stewards. Uh, of your tax dollars and how we spend those monies, how we make policies uh, should be most attentive, I think, at the, you know, moving forward to the bottom half of the wage scale uh, and, and, and taking into account that the top half uh, is doing just fine in California. Well, thank you very much for that. And um, a close, as a closing questions, what do you consider your most important, significant uh, contributions and achievements uh, as um, a California state senator? So I appreciate the question. So I, I think my most important contributions as a kind of a category are, are in the area of, of uh, electoral transparency and accountability. Um, very, very proud. Uh, one, I was the, the primary author originally of, of SCA 5, uh, which became Prop 69 in 2018, which the so-called uh, account the, the, the uh, gas tax lockbox. Uh, but one of the things I'm most proud of is actually a bill the governor vetoed, uh, and that was SB 660, I think two years ago. Uh, and what that bill would have done had the governor signed it, uh, it would have prohibited the practice, which is so common, 
uh, of uh, paid signature gatherers being paid on a per signature basis uh, for uh, petitions for recalls, referendums, and initiatives. Um, the veto message that the governor provided said that it, it would not, uh, you know, sort of serve the goal of eliminating uh, sort of undue influence in initiatives and recalls and referendum. I totally disagree, uh, and I think uh, the it's obvious to me every single Democratic club I've ever spoken to uh, equally agrees. Uh, and I'm now working on a similar reform, uh, SCA one, uh, which if uh, passed by the legislature and put in front of voters. Uh, would would reform the recall process. And, and, and as you know, uh, the way a recall works, uh, referencing back to the recent effort to recall Governor Newsom, there's one, two questions. First question is, should Gavin Newsom be recalled from the office of government? The second question, which I regard as inherently problematic, ask the question, you know, if he's recalled, whom would you choose? If the presence of that second question uh, is what, to I think, to a very real extent, creates incentives uh, to gin up recalls uh, against otherwise you know, thoroughly competent and, and sort of attentive uh, and integrity election officials. Uh, and I think if we can eliminate that recall question, we can restore uh, the recall back to what it was intended to be by its uh, framers uh, as a referendum on the probity and integrity of an elected official. Thank you very much. Well, it's now time for your closing. So please take about two minutes and fill in anything that you think you'd like to say by way of closing. All right. Uh, so again, thank you to uh, the Laguna Woods Democratic Club for having me. Um, and I, you know, thank you to every Democrat, especially members of clubs who participate fully actively and energetically in this process. Um, I, I am aware uh, of just what a great privilege it is uh, to serve as a member of the California State Senate. Uh, as I mentioned, I, you know, I've been recalled. I've probably been through uh, sort of more political ups and downs than most. Uh, I have never had a day where, where I, I'm not aware of and grateful for uh, the opportunity to serve. So politics gets a bad name these days uh, for some very valid reasons. But public service, I believe, is still a very noble calling. Uh, I was not in politics before I started doing this. Uh, I don't intend uh, to do. I'm not going to Congress. Uh, what I'm doing now is, is uh, hopefully getting an opportunity to continue representing Orange County uh, in the California State Senate. Uh, my new district uh, includes uh, your club uh, and 11 cities, including my city of Fullerton uh, in Orange County, Central Orange County. Uh, and I am very much looking forward uh, to the opportunity to talk to as many of my constituents, to as many voters as possible, and to make the case uh, that we really do need the best uh, and most conscientious people uh, in public service. And I think that's especially true in the California state legislature. We're a state of 40 million people uh, with an almost very uh, sort of disproportionately small legislature. That's 40 senators uh, and 80, 80 assembly people. It truly matters who represents you at every level, but especially at the state level. Very proud uh, to have had the opportunity. Uh, I think I'm proud of my record. I think anybody who has worked with me or observed me knows that I make decisions based on policy, on what's best for people, not on politics or my future. I fully plan to continue doing that. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to continue this discussion. Uh, and I thank you again for your consideration. Well, thanks again, Josh. And now here's uh, Sue. Thank you, Senator Newman, for taking the time from your busy schedule um, to talk with us today, um, to share your accomplishments in the Senate and to share your vision for the future. We appreciate it. And you're absolutely right. Um, being a public servant is a privilege um, and it's also a very, very difficult job. And we thank you for doing it. Thank you for having me.